ध्यानमूल गुरोर्मूर्ति पूजामूल गुरोपद मंत्रमूल गुरोवाक्य भक्तिमूल गुरोपा कस्तूरी तिलक ललाटपटले वक्रस्थले कौस्तुभम साग्रे वरमौक्ति करतले वेणु करे कंकण सर्वांगे हरिचंदन सुलित कंठे च मुक्तावली गोपस्त्री परिवेष्टि तो विजयते पुटे शयानम बालम मुकुंदम मनसा स्मरा यो ब्रह्मा विदधाति पूर्व यो वै वेदा प्रहणोति तस्म तग्वेवुद्धि प्रकाश मुक्षुर्वै शरणमहम प्रपद्ये Dear devotees, we'll do a few minutes of chanting, and after that, I'll, tonight I'll be explaining the story of Sudama. Bhajo giri dhar go vind go pala. Bhajo giri dhar go vind go pala. Bhajo giri dhar. 
Tonight I'll be sharing with you the story of Bhakt Sudama, who was a childhood friend of Krishna. And this, uh, this story is a very touching story, one of my favorite stories of the Bhagavatam. Sudama and Krishna went to the same Gurukul. They went to Sandipani Muni's Gurukul. After Krishna had left Braj, he went to Mathura and uh, he killed Kants and freed his mother and father. Devaki and Vasudev and very soon after that they decided it was time for him to study and they sent him to Sandipani Muni's Gurukul. So there Krishna and Sudama spent several years together growing up and studying in the Gurukul. After that they had gone their separate ways. Of course Krishna became a great ruler, later went to Dwarika, fought the Mahabharat war, told Gita, <clears throat> Meanwhile, Sudama had gotten married to a very pious woman named Sushila, and they lived a very simple life. Poor, you could say, even. But Sudama was totally happy, and Sushila was a very, very simple, very, very pious person. 
Sudama had no desire for any worldly enjoyments though. He just thought of Krishna all the time. And it didn't matter to him how poor he was. He just took every day as it came. You know, whether he got enough food today or he didn't. He didn't really worry about it. Some days he ate enough, some days he didn't. Shankaracharya was asked, Who is poor? Kova Daridro. His answer, he Vishal Trishna. The bigger one's desires, the more poor he is. And the smaller his desires, the more rich he is, the more impossible it becomes for him to feel poor. Sudama was like that. He had no, no desire to enjoy the luxuries of this world. He just took his life as it came, and in his mind he was thinking of Krishna all the time, so he was perfectly happy. One day his wife, Sushila, came to him and very humbly requested, suggested that, you know, isn't your childhood friend, Krishna, isn't he the king of Dwarika? And isn't he married to the goddess of wealth herself? Rukmini, Krishna's main queen <clears throat> is the avatar of Lakshmi. Lakshmi had done devotion to Krishna. These are all amazing inner divine secrets or the way it unfolds is amazing because Lakshmi is a divine goddess who is the Sandhini Shakti of Mahavishnu. Vishnu is the Shakti Man, Lakshmi is Shakti. She's the Almighty Power, He is the base in whom she resides. So the two are one. And Vishnu and Lakshmi are part of Radha Krishna's personality. Yet Lakshmi desires to experience the bliss of, you can say, Krishnanand, Premanand. The bliss that Radha Krishna give in their divine abode, Vrindavan. In fact, maybe later you can read the quote up in that right-hand corner. There's a quote from Sam Rahasya Upanishad, which is a conversation between Vishnu and Lakshmi. She's pressing his legs as he reclines on Sheshnag in Kshir Sagar. She notices he's always deeply absorbed in thinking of something or someone. So the next time he opened his eyes, she asked him, Can you tell me what do you think of when your eyes are closed? So he describes Vrindavan and the, the divine abode of Radha Krishna and Ras Leela and the amazing sweet Leelas of Vrindavan abode. So hearing that, Lakshmi had a desire in her heart to experience that. So it shows even, the, even God... <laughs> So there's different forms of one God, yet it's amazing that the, the very same God is desiring to experience that higher form of divine bliss. You can say it's, a, it's an illustration for us to make us understand that attaining Almighty God is one thing and attaining God in His absolute, the full bloom blissful form of divine love of Radha Krishna that's something more so Lakshmi decided I want to attain that so she went and did devotion Yadvan Chaya Shreer Lalana Charatapo Vihaya Kaman Suchiram Dhritavrata Bhagavatam she went and did devotion for a long time in order to gain entrance to Vrindavan abode, but she couldn't because she's almighty power, so she can't enter into Vrindavan abode. But she was given, you can say, a compromise. She was graced by Krishna that when I come on the earth planet, you can also join me in Dwarika, which is Kind of, you can say, in between. Vaikunt is the abode of Vishnu Lakshmi, where there's pure Aishwarya. Only almightiness, no personal interaction. And Vrindavan is the ultimate form 
of that uh, madhurya, you could say, the sweetest form of divine bliss. Now, in between comes Dwarika abode, where Krishna is formal to some degree, and there's almightiness in his behavior, but he's more friendly, less reserved than he is as Vishnu. So he said, you come and join me in Dwarika. So she got to become Rukmini, his main queen in Dwarika. So there she is, the goddess of wealth, Shri, Lakshmi. She is Krishna's main queen in Dwarika. So Sushila is saying, that's your childhood friend and he's married to the goddess of wealth. So what do you think about going and asking him for some wealth for us? We're, we're, we're so poor, we a lot of times don't have enough to eat. Then she said a very interesting thing. She says, Krishna is willing to give his own self to someone who submits themselves to his lotus feet. He'll give his own self to them. What to say of asking him for a few worldly things? So if he's willing to give his self, of course he's going to give some worldly things which are of no value. <laughs> Those are her words. She's saying it's of no value compared to him. So he'll probably give it very easily. So why don't you go and ask him? Now, Sudama is thinking, I don't want this for myself, but she's asking me respectfully, and it would be great to see Krishna again. In fact, that would be the highlight of my life, to go and visit with Krishna again. So he decided to go. And he asked Sushila, do we have anything in the house that I could bring as a gift? She said, Nothing. So she went and she begged from the neighbors and she got four handfuls of poha. Same thing we had for breakfast this morning. Probably not as fancy as what we had though. So just four handfuls of poha and she wrapped it in a torn piece of cloth, tied it up and gave it to Sudama and he tucked that in his own uh, dhoti, in his garment and he headed for Dwarika. So the whole time he was walking, he was so excited that he's going to meet Krishna again. And when he reached Dwarika, see there's three gates that you have to pass through to get to Krishna's main central area. So there's you know the first gate just to enter the city, and then there, in that first area, you can say the general public reside, then you come in closer and it's Krishna's extended family. And then you pass through the third gate and that's where Krishna himself lives. So those are guarded gates. There's a guard station 24 hours a day. There's someone guarding the city. And everybody who enters is stopped. Sudama was not stopped at all. He, I mean, he's himself is dressed in these torn, tattered, dirty garments. He doesn't look like anyone of any importance. He literally looks like a beggar. He just walked in. Nobody asked him. No one stopped him. He walked straight in front of Krishna's main palace. The door was open. He looks through the door. He sees in there, there's like a bed or a couch, a place to sit. And there, Rukmini and Krishna are sitting. He entered directly into the palace, saw Krishna. Krishna jumped up and ran to him and embraced him with tears in his eyes. He was so happy to see his childhood friend. And Rukmini was thinking, who's that? You know, Krishna's just jumping up and embracing him. It just looks like some beggar just walked straight in to his palace. But then she realized when she heard them talking because they're asking, you know, getting caught up with each other. You know, oh, did you get married? And all this, just like old friends meeting who haven't talked in so long. But first, Krishna took Sudama, seated him on the very seat where he and Rukmini were sitting. Rukmini was fanning Sudama now. Imagine the scene. He's seated on the throne. Rukmini is fanning him and Krishna brings water to wash his feet. He washes his feet and then he sprinkles the water on his own head. 
Then he takes sandalwood paste, which has a cooling effect, and he applied it to Sudama, applied it to his feet also because he'd been walking so much. He massaged his feet. He offered him pan. He did his arti. He lit some incense, offered that. So he treated him with great respect, as you would, as our Vedas say, you're supposed to treat a visitor. So Krishna treated him in that way. And then he sat down next to him, and they had some talks. They reminisced. And the people of the palace, the other servants, they were also amazed. They didn't know who Sudama was, and they were amazed that Krishna is treating him with so much respect. So then they talked. They talked about the old days in the Gurukul. They talked about one night how in the evening, uh, Sandipani Muni's wife had asked them to go out and get firewood. So they went out and they were collecting in the forest and then a big storm blew in unexpectedly. And it rained so hard that even the forest floor wasn't visible anymore. And there were just sheets of rain falling and heavy wind. So they didn't know which way to go to get back. And they were stuck there in the jungle for the night. So they just held on to each other for the whole night and waited for the night to pass. And in the morning, Sandipani Muni came and found them and expressed how much, he said, you have so much devotion to your guru that you went out to do this seva for me and you spent the whole night out here. So you're setting an example how someone is supposed to serve their guru. So they were just talking like this, recounting the stories from the days of the Gurukul. And Sudama says to Krishna that it's amazing that the very abode of the Vedas, Krishna, the one who produces the Vedas on the earth, the one about whom the Vedas tell, the one who is knowable through the Vedas, and the one who is the only one who knows the Vedas, he went to a Gurukul to learn the Vedas. Karmanya nihasya bhavo bhavasya te Durga shrayo bha thari bhayat manayanam Kalat mano yat pramadayuta shraya swatman rate khidyati dhir vidamiha bhagavatam. Brahma is expressing something similar when he says, Krishna, you have existed since eternity, so you're unborn, yet we call you the son of Nanda Baba, the son of Devaki and Vasudev. We call you Vasudev, means the son of Vasudev. We call you Yashoda Nandan, Nanda Nandan. So it's a contradiction. He says, you are the, the Lord of the God of death. Yamraj himself trembles in front of you. Yet when Jarasandh attacked for the 17th time in Mathura, Jarasandh was a powerful demon, but who is he in front of Krishna? Come on. Yet you ran, you and your brother Balram, you turned tail and ran all the way to Dwarika, leaving behind Mathura forever, and you never even looked back to see if he was chasing you. You just ran all the way to the seashore and started a new city there, Dwarika. So you're the Lord of the God of death, yet you're behaving in such a cowardly way? No one can understand how this is possible. You are swat manarate. You're self-complacent. You're blissful in and of your own self. Yet you're also doing so many leelas like doing ras with gopis, playing with the gwal balls, stealing butter. You have no desire, yet you're doing all these actions. So he says, khidyati dhira. Even the intellect, the most advanced intellect, 
khidyati. If he tries to understand your leelas instead of appreciating them, lovingly remembering them, instead he tries to analyze them, khidyati means his mind becomes exhausted and he fails to understand your leelas. So Sudama says, you went to Gurukul and studied the Vedas, it was only, it was just your leela. It was your grace on us to be there in that Gurukul. So Krishna is thinking in his mind that uh, I know why he's come here. Even though he doesn't have the desire, I know his wife sent him. I'm going to grace him today with more wealth even than the devatas have. He, Krishna is thinking in his mind. So he says, Oh my friend Sudama, have you brought me any gift? Sudama still had it tucked away in his garment and he was too embarrassed to seeing Krishna in this palace. He's going to offer him some dry poha. So Sudama just stayed quiet and Krishna explained to him, same verses in the Gita, he says the exact same verse now to Sudama in the Bhagavatam. Patram pushpam phalam toyam yo me bhaktya prayachhati. He says, the smallest gift from one of my devotees is of the greatest value to me. But if someone has no love in their heart for me, then they could offer me the greatest thing and it would not attract me at all. So if you've brought something, let's have it. No, no, I didn't bring anything. Krishna quickly reached in his garment and snatched the cloth and he opened it up and he said, you brought this for me? I'm so happy. And he took a mouthful and he started eating. Sudama was just amazed, thinking that Krishna is so kind and so gracious to those who love him. He doesn't consider their status. He only considers the love in their heart. Now Krishna is going for the second mouthful and Rukmini stopped him. She said, my Lord, and that's enough, really. Because with each mouthful, Sudama's wealth was growing. So with one mouthful, he had already become more wealth, wealthy, more opulent than even the celestial gods themselves. So Rukmini was thinking, what's going to be left? Don't give it all away. So one is good, so Krishna stopped. Now, Sudama has no idea what's going on. He just, he's happy that Krishna accepted his gift. He spent the rest of the night there. They ate together. Sudama rested for the night. And in the morning, Krishna again honored him with proper respect. And then they parted and Sudama left to go back to his place. So as he left and he was walking back to his house, he felt so satisfied having seen Krishna. And apparently he hadn't received anything. At this time, he doesn't know anything about what Krishna has done. He had decided not to ask Krishna for anything. He couldn't bear to ask him. And he just thought that, you know, I got to meet Krishna and now I'm going back. So as he's walking, he's again thinking that... Think who Krishna is and how did he treat me? Aishwaryasya samagrasya dharmasya yashasa shriyaha Jnana vairagya yoschaiva sharnam bhaga itirana He is Bhagavan. Bhag means six things that God has in unlimited amount. Aishwaryasya power, dharma, righteousness, goodness, you can say, shri means wealth, beauty, yash, uh, status, divine status, worshipfulness, jnana is knowledge and vairagya, self-complacency, detachment. He has all six of those in unlimited amount. So compare him to me. Sudama is thinking, I'm just a soul. 
an ordinary person with uncountable lifetimes of past bad actions, not only good, but uncountable bad actions, so I'm a sinner, compared to Krishna, and look at how he treated me. He is supreme God with all those divine opulences, and I am a lowly beggar, yet he treated me like his own brother. The goddess of wealth, Rukmini, served me. He gave me, he showed me more respect than you would to a devata. So it showed, Krishna practically showed what he himself says in the Bhagavatam. Natatha me priyatam atmayo nirnashankara nacha sankarshano nashrir naivatma chayatha bhavan. He says that my devotee who just loves me without any demand or desire just loves me as a friend or with a desire to serve me or with any loving feeling. That devotee is more dear to me and he enumerated. He's more dear to me than Lakshmi. He's more dear to me than Brahma. He's more dear to me than Shiva. He's more dear to me than Balram. He's more dear to me than my own soul. Just my humble devotee. Just like Ram says, Bhagati hina viranchi kina hoi sab jiva hi mohi priya sam hoi Bhagati vanta ati nichahu prani mohi pran priya asimam bani He says, if Brahma has no bhakti for me in his heart, then he would be of no more, he would not be any more affectionate to me than any ordinary soul. Yet even the most lowly being, if he has love for me in his heart, then I consider him to be more dear than my own soul, than my own life. Purushana punsak nari nar Jeeva chara char koi Sarva bhav bhaj kapat taji Mohi param priya soi Ram is saying again, If he leaves all the craftiness and wholeheartedly worships me, then I don't care who he is in the world. Mohi param priya soi Paramapriya means he's the most loving, the most dear to me. And yet, Bhagavatam. Even someone of a high, noble, respectable birth, who's born in a respectable family, who has all the good qualities, who's educated, intelligent, kind, generous. Yet if that person has no bhakti for me in his heart, compare that person to the lowest person, say, in terms of the society, the lowest person, whoever that may be, if that person has love in their heart for me, then I consider that person to be higher than any other person in the society. So he doesn't look at our material status or our material gunas, our qualities. Vyadhasya charanam dhruvasya chavayo vidya gajendrasya ka kubjaya a saint says, look at Krishna's graciousness, his kindness, how he doesn't look to the, the qualities of the devotee, he looks to the love in their heart. 
He says, Dhruv was so young, he had no, you know, normally we consider if someone is elder, then they're more respectable. Dhruv was a five-year-old. Krishna didn't care. The uh, Gajendra had no knowledge whatsoever. He was just an animal. Yet, he surrendered to Krishna, so Krishna accepted him. Kubja was a hunchback. What beauty did she have? No beauty. No one in the world would even look towards her. Or if they did, it was out of uh, contempt. Yet, Krishna accepted her as his own. Why? Because she surrendered to him. She accepted him. And Sudama had no wealth or status. Kim tat sudam no dhanam. Kim? Kim dhanam. What, what wealth did Sudama have? In the world, we look, oh, a wealthy person? Oh, I, I'll get close to that person. They might help me out sometime if I need help. So we have a reason. Someone's beautiful? Oh, I'd like that person to be my friend. Krishna doesn't look at any of these things. He looks at the love in the devotee's heart. So he gives his own self to the one who surrenders to him. It makes bhakti so simple. We don't need to be great to impress God. Nothing we can do will impress God except accepting him in our heart. That's it. Think of him as a friend. Think of him as your own child. Think of him as your mother or father or your loving master. And he becomes yours. So Sudama is walking and he's thinking and he's amazed at Krishna's humbleness and his kindness. And he also thinks that it's a good thing Krishna didn't give me any wealth. He did me a favor. Because I know people who get wealth, what happens to them? They're probably better off, they were, might have been better off before. You know, they have, uh, nowadays you, you have meetings, like let's say someone has been divorced. So they might go to a meeting of other people who have been divorced and then they talk about their problems and they try to help each other. So there's similar, you know, groups like that that meet. So there's a group that meets for lottery winners. Yeah, people who have won the lottery whose life was ruined after winning the lottery. Because everybody that they knew became demanding and ended up disliking them because they didn't give them enough or they didn't give them what they wanted or they used that money and ruined themselves. You know, they developed bad habits or used it for wrong things or they squandered the whole thing, including what they had before. They ended up more poor than what they were. So there are groups that have to help these people. Yet if you ask someone, you know, if you won $250 million, would your life get better or worse? Who would say that their life would get worse? So not, that's the physical aspect. And then when it comes to our surrender to God, there's a whole other effect. Our scriptures say, there are four kinds of people in the world. Two are very common and two are very rare. The first two who are very common are the one who has no wealth or status or prestige in the world and they remember God a lot. This is common. The less someone has, the more likely they are to think of God. Then the second very common type of person to meet is someone who has great power or wealth or status and who doesn't think about God. That's also very, that's normal. Then the two rare people to meet is the one with nothing who doesn't think of God. That's very rare. And the one with everything who, despite having all of that, does think of God. That's also very rare to find. So this is why our scriptures say, Artho narthasya karanam. The karana of anarth, 
of being ruined is art. <laughs> the reason, the number one reason for people falling, either mentally or falling from devotion, whatever it may be, is art, wealth. So Sudama says, I'm glad Krishna didn't give me anything. In Tulsidas Ji's words, Shri Madhabakra Nakin Hakehi Prabhuta Badhira Nakahi Nahi Ko As Janama Jagmahi Prabhuta Pai Jahi Madhanahi Who has there ever been in the world who, having received great wealth and power, didn't become intoxicated in their mind with the pride of that wealth or that power. It's very subtle. We don't even realize it, but it's there. So Tulsidas Ji says, Sukh ke maathe sil pare Naam hiyate jaya Balihari va dukh ki Jo pal pal naam Let that suffering be praised if it helps me remember God. And let that wealth or that success or that, uh, those possessions or whatever it may be, if it makes me forget God or it distracts me from God, then let that be ruined. But balihar to that hardship that brings God's name in my heart helps me remember God. So although most people in the world have a desire for wealth, yet it's not always the best thing for us. And we get our wealth or we don't get wealth normally according to our past life's actions. However much charity we did in our past life, that much wealth will come to us in this life. But whatever we have, we should be very careful with that wealth because there is a natural intoxicating effect. We should carefully direct our mind towards God and use our wealth for something good in the world, not just accumulate it and along with it multiply our pride and our attachments, but keep that, take that money and use it where it's needed. After our own basic needs are met, the rest should be used for service in this world. This is what Veda Vyasji says in the Bhagavatam. Yavadbriet Jataram Tavatsvatvam Hidehinam. How much wealth should you hold on to for yourself? Just enough that you need to get your two rotis and some clothes to cover your back. The rest, donate, donate, donate. Find a good cause, find people in need, use it for something good. There are other people in the world who don't even have enough to eat. And you're worried about what size of widescreen TV you're going to get? Shame on us. Think about it. That's why Veda Vyasji says, if you have more than you need and you don't use it to help those who don't even have enough to eat, then you'll be treated as a thief according to the law of karma or dandamarhati. You'll receive a punishment as if you had stolen that wealth even though you may have earned it honestly. <laughs> because it's God's wealth, we earned it from His good green earth we accumulated it and hoarded it for our own personal enjoyment above and beyond our basic physical needs. And there were other people, our brothers and sisters on this earth planet, who didn't even have enough to have a good meal. So there's nothing wrong with having wealth. But the healthiest thing for our mind is to use that wealth in charity and not let it grow as an intoxication and a pride that makes us forget God. So we can use it as charity, and in that charity we can also feel that we're giving God's things that he had entrusted to us, and we're giving it to his souls. So it's not ours. He lent it to me, and now I'm putting it where it needs to go. 
So Sudama was thinking that it's good Krishna didn't give me any wealth. I'm glad he didn't. This way my mind will stay in him. But when he arrived to where he thought his house used to be, he didn't recognize anything. He looked around. Where did my house go? There was a huge palace bigger than Krishna's palace in Dwarika with servants dressed in beautiful saris and dhotis and wearing all the jewels and gold. And then he sees Sushila walk out dressed like a, a celestial goddess. And he enters and he's saying, you know, where did our house go? And they say, oh, please come in. Everyone's welcoming him. This is your house, my Lord. Please come in. He sees the walls are made of crystal and embedded with all kinds of precious jewels. And there's just, you know, couches and beds and all kinds of luxuries everywhere. Then he realized what Krishna had, did, had done. So he lived the rest of his life there in that luxury. Can you imagine the same Sudama who barely had enough to eat? He lived a life of luxury for the rest of his days without being attached to it at all. His mind was the same as it was when he was a beggar. Just like Ram said about his brother Bharat, Bharata hi hoi na raj madhu vidhi hari har pad paaya. Even if Bharata attained the seat of Vishnu or Shiva or Brahma, he wouldn't get a pride of his power because he has so much devotion to me, Ram is saying. So Sudama was in that state that it didn't matter what kind of wealth he had. His mind was just in Krishna all the time. It was fine for him if he's sitting on the dirt floor to eat a little bit of rice. Or he's sitting you know, on a crystal table and, and eating a chappan bhog. It's all the same to him. Just put some food in his belly and keep thinking of Krishna. It doesn't matter to him. So he lived out the rest of his days like that. Although he didn't stay too much longer on the earth after that. And then he went to Krishna's divine abode and joined him there. So this is the story of Sudama. And we can take two main things from this story. Again, the message of selfless devotion. How not to ask God for any worldly thing. And just to submit your loving feelings to him. And however you love him. He loves you the same way in return. So that's very important in devotion as well. We learn Raga Nuga Bhakti here at Radha Madhav Dham, which means just that. You can say these two things, not asking God for any worldly thing and just having a relationship in our mind with him, with the faith that however we love him, he's going to love us the same way in return. That's Raga Nuga Bhakti. You have those feelings, and along with that, you do what I mentioned yesterday, shravarn, kirtan, smaran, that's the form of bhakti. Be selfless, love him in your own way, and then while you have those loving feelings, you imagine his form, chant his name, listen to his leelas. In fact, devotion is so easy. You like this story of Sudama? Just think of this story. You're doing bhakti. Devotion doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. There's a leela of Krishna that you like, something that touched your heart. Just think of that leela any time of the day you're doing devotion to Krishna. You're chanting, think of that leela, you're doing devotion. So you can think of any leela of Krishna. Chant his name along with that or just quietly think of the leela. So when we say do rup dhyan, it doesn't just mean the form. You can also think of a lila. That also counts as rup dhyan. So again, this is the practical form of bhakti. This is what we practice here. And what you can, this is what you can practice even when you go back to your house. And now we'll sing one kirtan by Kripaluji Maharaj. It's actually a kavali. Tera naam sunke data. So in this kirtan, the devotee is saying that I'm a beggar 
and I've come to your door, and I know that you are supremely gracious, so I'm going to wait here until you grace me with your divine bliss. I'm not asking for any worldly thing.